Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this interview on doing sociology. Today, we have with us Professor Bina Agarwal. Professor Agarwal is a professor of development economics and environment at the University of Manchester, UK, which she joined in late 2012. She was earlier the director and professor at the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi. She has been president of the International Society for Ecological Economics, president of the International Association for Feminist Economics, and Vice President of the International Economic Association. She was the first woman from the Global South to hold these positions. She was also held distinguished positions at major universities, including at Harvard, Princeton, Minnesota, and Cambridge. Agarwal is a prolific writer with over 100 academic papers and 13 books. She brings to her work insights from both theory and field experience. She pioneered the issue of women's land rights in her prize-winning book, a field of one's own, placing the issue centrally on the agenda of governments, NGOs, and international agencies. Women's land rights is now a key target in Sustainable Development Goal 5. Her recent books include Gender and Green Governance, Gender Challenges, which is a three-volume compendium of her selected papers, and Gender Inequality in Developing uh, Economies, translated into Italian. Beyond academics, Professor Agarwal has also contributed to policy change. She has contributed to India's five-year plan. In 2005, she led a successful civil society campaign for amending the Hindu Succession Act to make it gender equal. Bina Agarwal works across disciplines, economics, law, political science, anthropology. In fact, she was invited to teach inheritance law by the New York University School of Law, although she is entirely self-taught in law. She works on diverse research themes. Using the lens of political economy and gender, she has written extensively on land and livelihood, environmental change, bargaining and gender relations, poverty and inequality, agriculture, and most recently, group farming in India and Europe, on which she is now writing a book. She also writes for newspapers. She has received several awards since her student days. These include uh, several book prizes, a Padma Shri and the International Balzan Prize 2017 for challenging established premises in economics and the social sciences by using an innovative gender perspective. The Balzan is one of Europe's biggest prizes and she is only the second woman from the Global South to win it since its inception in 1961. Professor Agarwal was also awarded the Order of Agricultural Merit by the French government and holds honorary doctorates from the University of Antwerp in Belgium and the Institute of Social Studies at The Hague. Uh, we welcome you, Professor Agarwal, to this interview and thank you so much for taking time out to do this. So uh, let's begin with the first question on your path-breaking award-winning book published in 1994 titled A Field of One's Own Gender and Land Rights in South Asia. You have argued that the single most important factor affecting women's economic and social status is their command over property, especially land. Now, several decades later, do you think that this still holds? And if so, in what ways? Thank you. Yeah, so you can imagine how many decades have passed. And the answer is yes, it does. Um, in fact, uh, since I wrote the book in which I had garnered a fair amount of empirical evidence, there is even more empirical evidence today of the importance of women owning land, not just for India, but more globally. Uh, and in the book, uh, what I had done was I had uh, talked about the impact on welfare, on efficiency and empowerment. Um, and so if you look at the welfare effects, there is a substantially growing body of evidence on the positive effect of the mother owning land and assets on child survival, on ed child, children's education, and on health outcomes. And there's a paper that a colleague and I did um, subsequent to the book um, in which we looked at um, whether uh, owning immovable property like land or a house would make uh, a difference to domestic violence. Uh, till then, much of the research on that uh, topic had, in looking at women's economic status, had focused on employment. And um, we, what we uh, then uh, collected data. There were 500 randomly selected households uh, for Kerala, uh, and um, we found that uh, 
owning land um, or a house for women was a huge deterrent to domestic violence. So just to give you some uh, stats, um, the uh, incidence of domestic violence was 49% um, when uh, the women own neither land or house and 7% if they own both. And then it was in between 17%, 10% if they owned uh, land or a house. And uh, they had basically uh, women had, a, and uh, if you if you would uh, want to call that a credible uh, exit option, uh, and that uh, deterred uh, violence. And then we, of course, uh, econometrically controlled for a range of other factors like employment and and uh, uh, educational gaps, um, alcohol abuse, um, the family um, uh, state, uh, economic status, and also social support systems. And we found several factors are important, but property ownership was the most uh, uh, significant uh, new finding uh, that we found in, in this research. Um, so, so you can see that the, wealth, the, uh, the importance um, is then underlined by increasing amount of empirical evidence as far as welfare is concerned. And then I talked about efficiency, um, which is really the, um, uh, the uh, impact of women owning land on uh, say farm productivity. Now we must remember that 75% of rural uh, women um, workers are still in agriculture. And we also know that uh, de facto, um, and there are increasing proportion of farmers because more men than women go into migrate to um, non-farm jobs, especially into urban areas. And, and so the um, food security and the farm productivity can depend hugely on the productivity of women farmers. And it, interestingly, in 2011, uh, the FAO had uh, brought out a report which focused on this um, across developing countries. And according to its assessment, it found that um, yields uh, could be raised by 20 to 30% and agricultural output by 2.4 to 4% uh, in developing economies um, if women had the same access to resources as men. So, so you can see that, that this is, uh, again, a substantial advance uh, in terms of empirical findings. And then there is the issue of, of empowerment, which um, you know, economists, uh, in, feminist economists in particular, have been uh, also measuring. They look at decision-making within the household. They look at women's mobility. Um, and we know that political status can also matter in terms of uh, whether you uh, own immovable property or not. Um, so on all those counts, I think the case is um, as strong and even stronger today uh, than it was when I wrote A Field of One's Own. Right. Uh, Ma'am, since you were talking about your book, A Field of One's Own, where you've uh, dedicated several chapters on inequalities and in inheritance laws. Also, uh, you focus on the gap between law and practice. So has there been any progress on the legal front as of today? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So it's, uh, there's been huge uh, advance. Uh, so for instance, um, the, the first big amendment was of course the 1956 Hindu Succession Act, which was passed uh, soon after independence, which already gave women substantial uh, rights uh, in, uh, in property, but not equal rights. Um, for Hindus, and then there were uh, inequalities for other religious communities. Now, uh, the, um, uh, but after the amendment of the Hindu Succession Act of 2005, among Hindu families, sons and daughters have equal rights in, um, in joint family property, as well as, of course, in the father's uh, separate property. Uh, and this covers both married and unmarried daughters. So prior to 2005, uh, some states uh, in the South in particular, and also Maharashtra had passed minor, uh, smaller amendments giving unmarried daughters um, uh, rights uh, in uh, joint family property, but the 2005 gave it more comprehensively to all daughters. Uh, and also daughters have a right, uh, legal right to return uh, to their parental home, they can be kartas uh, of joint family property, they can ask for partition. So these have been major uh, developments and improvements as far as the law is concerned. 
And uh, similarly, if you if you look from the 50s onwards, you find that uh, for Parsis and Christians also, um, there is uh, the equality um, for sons and daughters in terms of property. So if you add all these um, all this up, you about 83 to 84 percent of uh, women in India have um, equal rights um, uh, as their brothers. Uh, to um, you know, to property, uh, family property, um, but there are inequalities which remain. And for uh, for instance, for Muslim women uh, who have strong rights, uh, but they are unequal because according to the Sharia, um, uh, the uh, women tend to get half the shares of men. And also among tribal communities, the law is not codified, so they are still subject to uh, uh, they are still subject to customary laws, and uh, most of them are uh, are gender unequal. So what I'm saying is that we've made uh, very substantial advances uh, legally for most in, in Indian women. Um, and there is uh, some way still to go, of course. Uh, but uh, on the legal front, uh, I think uh, there have been uh, notable gains. And uh, what about the situation in practice? Do women uh, own land as a result? So, so here is the here is the crunch. Um, so, in practice, actually, I recently published a, a paper in the Journal of, of Development Studies, uh, 2021, co-authored with two young colleagues, um, and we used uh, one of the difficulties that I've been finding is in trying to um, obtain data uh, for um, uh, assessing uh, what is the gender gap in property. And in in India, you find that the agricultural census. Um, for instance, collects data on ownership, but not uh, uh, gendered. It collects data on operational holdings, which is gendered. And often people make the mistake of, uh, of taking that figure of 13 to 14%, which is operational holdings and assuming that that is the ownership. Um, the National Sample Survey again collects data on land, but it doesn't um, uh, disaggregate by gender. So I was alerted to uh, a data set collected by the ICRISAT. Um, and um, we analyzed this, um, and it's a rare data set. It covered nine states. And uh, we uh, looked at, um, uh, we found that if we analyze the um, rural landowning households, and look at uh, who owns land in that. So in 2014, which was the last year of that particular uh, survey, um, we found that only 16% of households had any female owners. Uh, and overall, um, women constituted only 14% um, of all landowners. And they owned only 11% of the land, of the farmland. Um, so you can see there's a huge gap. Whatever indicators you use, it's it's a very big gap, despite the fact that in 2005, um, you know, legally, um, the rights were uh, have been equal. So this is this is data relating to 2014, which is many years later. Um, I, I do want to mention that regionally in India, um, uh, we uh, some regions do better than others. South India, in general, does better. Uh, but even the best performing state, which is Telangana, even uh, here, only 30, 32% of landowners are women. And in Odisha, you know, it's only 5.6%. Uh, and um, also what is notable, which was, uh, which we found uh, uh, and it was, and it was a bit of a surprise, uh, that 46% um, uh, of the female landowners were widows. And most of the others also, um, most of them, the widows were um, uh, 50 or above. And um, overall, if you look at other female owners, they had also acquired their land mainly through the marital families, uh, sometimes through land purchase along with their husbands, rather than through uh, inheritance from their parents. And uh, one can argue that uh, owning no land at all or, uh, or only receiving it when you're aging widows um, uh, means that most Indian women get uh, landed assets, even the few that do, um, at a much later time in the life cycle. Uh, uh, that uh, which is a bit late for them it, to benefit them in the same way for their families. So, for instance, you know, I had cited um, uh, evidence earlier uh, in your earlier question uh, that uh, the it's the mother's assets which affect the children's welfare. But if the, if the mother is widowed, if the children are grown up, then many of these benefits will obviously um, not apply. Uh, 
Um, and um, and the, it, the same relates to the evidence on um, uh, deterrence of spousal violence. Um, so the who gets the land and at what stage in the life cycle also matters and not just a figure of gender inequality. I think this is important and often missed out. Our next question is related. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, are the reasons behind these regional variations that you have mentioned? Um, so, of course, I mean, there are historical factors, but I think there are a couple of things that I can emphasize, and this will interest you, uh, especially uh, within sociology, because they provide us, uh, sociologists and anthropologists have provided us a lot of evidence. One is social norms, but people use social norms in a very general way these days. Everybody is talking about social norms. We need to ask what social norms. And particularly, for instance, marriage norms matter. Whom, do you, whom are you allowed to marry? And what is your post-marital residence? So um, Hindu families in North India um, forbid marriages, as we know, within the village and to close kin. So uh, both these aspects um, are linked to notions of incest and so on. So marriage is forbidden uh, between those who are related across several generations uh, from uh, the side of both parents. Um, and daughters therefore perforce um, uh, are married to strangers, uh, especially if you're rural women. Um, and uh, they're seen as belonging to another family and giving them land is seen as, uh, as losing the land. Now, so there's a strong resistance to giving daughters land. And if you, if you, if you do uh, interviews, uh, these are the kinds of things that people will say uh, that she now belongs to another family. Uh, but in South India, by contrast, interestingly, among Hindus, Hindu families, they allow uh, village in village marriage and close kin marriage um, between cross cousins, uncle niece marriages. And um, this helps the land remain within the extended family uh, and uh, within the village. Uh, so there is less resistance to endowing daughters. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, the uh, daughters will get land as my figures show, they don't automatically do that, but there is less resistance uh, to this. And I think when we often when we talk about marriage norms, we tend to forget uh, that uh, even within Hindu communities, there's so much variation uh, and, 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 and so on. Now, the second, um, I think, important social norm is uh, what, uh, what I call female seclusion norms, um, which can have two dimensions. One is this practice of gungat uh, and veiling and so on, um, parda. Uh, but the other is the uh, gender segregation of public space. Now, both of them restrict women's mobility and the ability to manage land. So for instance, of course, uh, I don't have to belabor that uh, a, a Gungat or a Parda in North India uh, is practiced particularly in North India and not, not in South India and, uh, and uh, Northeast India typically. Um, but you know, beyond wailing, there is this uh, idea of the gender segregation of uh, public space. So, um, so what do I mean by that? You know, the, the idea that a good woman is expected to avoid spaces that are dominated by men, you know, uh, be it marketplaces and so on. And um, where we know a lot of informal networking is done by men to, um, uh, to in terms of farming transactions, that's where you would go say, okay, you know, you need uh, labor on a particular day and so on. So this really restricts women farmers. Um, now, some of this is changing, of course, you know, with the panchayats, you have people are getting much more used to women panches and, um, and pradhans. Um, so uh, it is changing, but it hasn't, it hasn't gone away. Um, and then, um, you know, there's something which I term the social legitimacy of women's claims. And there are diverse, um, uh, there are diverse notions across cultures, across uh, religions, about who deserves to inherit a person's property. Uh, so we know that all cultures emphasize uh, blood ties, um, and some some favor men over women, uh, and in some cultures, religions. Um, and it, it the most deserving is the person who, for instance, performs the parents last rites. And that's typically expected to be the son. Or marital ties might be important. For instance, widows are, are socially uh, favored um, uh, over other heirs. And you'll be interested to know that this is not just in, you know, in South Asia. It's actually even in Europe. If you look at uh, their laws, you find that um, widows are, uh, have a particular priority. Um, and uh, the, 
then proximity to um, uh, of residence can matter, so postmarital residence. So parents might say, who will look after me under in old age? And of course, if the daughter is very far away, uh, it's less likely. Um, so all these factors make a difference and they're linked to social norms. Uh, but also what I find happening now um, is that uh, the, um, uh, who is willing to um, cultivate also matters. Um, so I, I, there's a, you know, a colleague and I did a, did a study of some uh, using NSS data of some 50,000 households where the, um, they'd been asked, well, do you like farming? And, you know, 40% of them said no. And then we had tried to analyze who are these people. And they, many of them were disadvantaged farmers, but uh, also the younger people and also women more than men. Uh, so uh, the uh, so possibly one of the uh, elements of why in in the few households where land goes to the widows particularly it's possible that you know the she is more willing to cultivate uh, than uh, uh, than an adult son who would normally claim the land but who doesn't want to farm and so on so there are there are particular changes which we need to keep in mind on. Um, what, uh, what, what sorts of factors lead to regional variations, but also changes over time. Right. Uh, you've played a key role in the amendment of the Hindu Succession Act to make it more, uh, to make it gender equal. Uh, this was in 2005, uh, where you led a successful civil society campaign. Now, how did you learn the law so well? <laughs> It was very hard work, <laughs> you know, and it's entirely self-taught um, because uh, I, uh, my book, you remember, it was not just on India, it was in South Asia. So I covered, also covered Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And uh, the, um, and you know, inheritance laws are particularly complicated because they vary by region, by religion and type of property. And so land is treated differently, I discovered, from other types of property. So to understand the inheritance of land, you had to look not only, for instance, like the Hindu Succession Act or the uh, laws uh, applying to Parsis, uh, Muslims, and, and Christians, but also that um, uh, the tenurial laws of every state. And you know, in the Northwest, at least six states actually specified the order of inheritance. This is the land reform laws. And they had, they had been changing over time. So I sat for many months in the Supreme Court um, library. There is a local uh, laws uh, section, which is one very large room with many, many, many people. In that point, lots of mosquitoes uh, as well. <laughs> and uh, I laboriously went through it. I felt it was very important um, to do that um, because uh, the, uh, if you don't understand uh, the legal framework, um, you would not be able to then understand uh, what's happening. Uh, the, what are the what are the kinds of obstacles that exist? Um, I, I I was uh, I learned enough law to um, uh, to be invited to teach uh, inheritance law by the New York University School of Law, and, um, and and then of course I was able to use some of this knowledge when I was. Um, working with um, civil society um, for the amendment of the 2005. Um, so in a way, I'm very glad that I put in all that work um, because it was not only important for the, my academic writing, um, but then it proved extremely useful uh, later uh, to be able to, uh, you know, make an intervention uh, in policy and law itself. Right. So, uh, you know, how important do you think interdisciplinary work is for understanding inequalities of gender, caste, and race? Well, as you can already tell, I think it's extremely important because, you know, if you take as an economist, you talk about property, it's an economic asset, you talk about property rights. Um, but the way in which rights to property are talked about by other disciplines is also different, you know, because you recognize, take land. So land is not just an asset, uh, economic asset, but it's also, uh, it also has meaning in terms of identity citizenship rights uh, for people, and it has multiple meanings. So um, to understand inequalities in property ownership, uh, we 
uh, do need to know uh, inequalities uh, that are embedded in the inheritance laws, which I've just talked about. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's also um, in uh, India, 86, about 85 to 86% of land is privately owned. And, and your access to that is particularly through inheritance or through gift. So again, uh, understanding that is, uh, is extremely important. And in addition, um, you know, the questions you've asked, for instance, of why despite legal advances, there's a gap between law and practice. And there, um, uh, you know, anthropology and sociology in the conventional way in which it was done, um, uh, provides uh, detailed information on social norms and practices. Uh, so in uh, 1990, you know, for my 1994 book, I remember when I was at Harvard before that in over 89 to 92, um, I read through hundreds of ethnographies um, and uh, village studies and so on. And they provided me the basis for actually drawing maps, cultural maps. You know, if you, if you see the book, you'll find that in chapter eight, I have maps which show um, how regional variations in Parda practices or regional variations in close cousin marriage or village endogamy. And those have been drawn on the basis of drawing on almost every ethnography I could lay my hands on um, uh, and so on. So, I, so it is, it, it's extremely important because as you can see, uh, to understand why there's a gap between law and practice, I drew on that. Um, and then um, one can argue that you want to, because land is a productive asset, um, if farm productivity is important. So suppose you ask the question, well, um, okay, men and women own land and how different are they uh, in terms of its use or its productivity? And so you need to know something about agriculture and agronomy uh, to, to understand that. You, you, you think of the various factors which could lead to differences uh, and you have to control for those factors. Um, so uh, the so in a, so essentially um, you what I uh, for this kind this sort of topic that uh, you know it was uh, economics law agricultural economics law anthropology sociology uh, and I might add history as well because of course everything has a historical dimension and um, in uh, in the early chapters, in chapter, chapters three and four, I actually um, went back historically to see what documents existed, uh, documents or other evidence um, uh, to show whether or not women owned land or they had any control over it. You know, there's, uh, the, 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 and then, you know, there's the Dharma Shastra. So I, <laughs> I read to the English translation of that, Kami's translations of that. Um, and so my long answer to your short question uh, is that uh, interdisciplinary work is extremely important. But I also feel that being rooted in one discipline is also important. So uh, it's uh, otherwise what you do is you touch various disciplines, perhaps not in depth. So, so being rooted in a discipline where you can both extend that discipline and critique it uh, you need to know uh, know that in depth. And therefore, in, in a sense, I feel that my training in economics was actually very useful when I was self-teaching myself law because the structures, you know, when you try and understand structures and, and, and so on, you, you, uh, there are some uh, aspects of uh, common uh, uh, way of conceptualizing things which, are, which you learn from one discipline, which you can use for another. Right. Um, Ma'am, your recent work shows uh, how, despite advances in law, very few women own land in India. You've argued that families don't want to give daughters land, and many women give up their claims to keep their relationships with brothers intact. Are there other ways that women can acquire land? Yeah, okay. Um, before I answer the question, let me just say this, that um, even in relation to <clears throat> Even in relation to um, uh, in, uh, inherited land or land from families, um, there are several things that need to be done. Uh, awareness of the law, um, both among women uh, and, and uh, the community, but also among the um, you know, people, the village officials who actually register the claims. 
uh, and uh, you have non-governmental organizations in various uh, states who have been um, trying to train people um, on the ground and also sensitize them. Uh, so that suppose you 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 uh, if if the father if there's a deceased father, then today both daughters and sons are claimants to joint family property, and that is very important to make sure that that's registered. But having said that, and given the resistance of families to give daughters land, one way or the other, um, the as you as you mentioned, um, women are some uh, you know uh, nudged towards. Uh, giving up their claims in favor of others. Um, the other sources would be the state and markets. Now, the uh, government often distributes uh, land as part of land reform, maybe an acre or a hectare. And it's been doing this in India and uh, other South Asian countries. It's been doing this uh, from the time of independence, um, uh, where uh, under land reform program, surplus land was taken from the larger farmers. And then the idea was to distribute it to the landless or the near landless. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the um, initially there was quite a strong bias because that land usually was given to the male head of household. And if you look at the 50s and 60s, that's what was happening. Um, there was not, there was an assumption if, the, if you give a, a resource uh, uh, to the male head of household, all the family members have, will gain. Uh, and, um, I've written about this in terms of the, uh, you know, the and uh, that um, it follows a, a unitary household model, assumptions of unitary household model, um, uh, where uh, the uh, the assumption is that um, you know her, uh, preferences uh, and, uh, um, and 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 uh, um, and so on are shared, resources are shared, and therefore an altruistic household head would. Uh, make sure that everybody gains. In practice, we know that's not the case. So hence, we need to have a more bargaining approach. So you find that there's been some shifts in that, um, partly my work, partly um, you know awareness raising by NGOs and so on, that now government, then it distributes land or housing, uh, but does. Uh, it's given to um, both spouses. And sometimes if, uh, you know, say single women or widows, then it may be given to them alone. Uh, but the amount of surplus land is very limited, you know, with, as, as you know, and uh, you don't want the commons, a lot of the common land which, uh, which was in, uh, has, has disappeared, where people used to gather fiber and fodder and raise the animals, you find this huge disappearance. Um, so that source uh, is as a potential source is quite limited. The other source is markets, which is that suppose you purchase land or lease in land. Now, purchasing land, of course, is uh, difficult. Um, uh, women have fewer resources than men. Uh, for, you don't have enough financial resources to purchase land. And also, most people don't want to sell their land, you know, because of the, uh, they, they, they keep the ancestral land, they want to keep it intact. So in land markets, you find that um, there aren't huge transactions, especially in rural areas. However, uh, nevertheless, as far as the financial resources are concerned, uh, government, the government could provide subsidized uh, support to women to acquire land. And there are examples of that uh, in, the, um, in Andhra Pradesh, for instance, under NTR. There was a scheme where if women, Dalit women, formed a group, they could purchase land as a group. Uh, say 10 women, they purchased 10 acres, and then they would register each in one person's name. And they, it was a 20, you know, it was a grant come uh, uh, come uh, uh, credit scheme, uh, and it but it was a twenty year uh, thing, so you could repay back in the long in the long term, and part of it was grant. So you could provide such support um, as well. Um, but more particularly, and I've been writing on this now for the past many years, is the possibility of leasing in land by groups of women because individual women don't have the resources to do that. And in Kerala, for instance, there are 68,000 all women groups who are cultivating in groups and who are, uh, uh, who are leasing in land predominantly, but jointly. So uh, the next question is related to that, okay. that you have been writing on group farming in recent years extensively. So mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about what it means and how they are performing? and if this model is replicable. 
Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, actually, if you, um, Field of Unsold was a big book in the sense there's too many pages and you, uh, but if you actually read the last chapter, which is called um, the long march ahead. Um, the, uh, I do mention that uh, there isn't enough land to go around at an individual basis, but groups could um, you know, try and acquire it. So um, I've returned to that in much more in depth. Um, uh, so, so the women's groups that I mentioned, 68,000 are really doing group farming. So you'll ask, well, what is group farming? And uh, group farming basically means that you uh, come together uh, voluntarily uh, to uh, pool all your resources, land, labor, capital, uh, and you cultivate together and you then share the costs and benefits. Uh, so uh, in the, in, in, in the uh, I did quite detailed empirical work uh, in several uh, places, but particularly in Kerala and also in, in uh, then Andhra, now Telangana. Uh, and what I um, wanted to see was that um, our, uh, the group farming in Kerala is done by all women's groups, all the members of groups. And this was, uh, this was particularly facilitated by uh, the state's poverty eradication program, Kudum Shri. Uh, and basically what it started is that you have neighborhood groups, you have saving and credit groups. And among those groups, if some women want to do a group enterprise, they can. And it, many women then started doing group farming. So um, I uh, collected data for group farms and individual family farms um, to see how they performed, whether group farming uh, was, um, you know, they could, it could be socially empowering, but was it also economically? Um, more profitable. Uh, and, um, uh, and it was very intensive data collection, by the way, because I, uh, it was weekly data for every input and output for every plot, every crop over an entire 12 to 13 months. And I found uh, that uh, the uh, group farms, all women group farms were 1.8 times, um, had 1.8 times the annual value of output per hectare compared to um, the largely male managed individual family farms, 95% of which were male managed in fact. And um, I also then uh, calculated the um, net returns per farm and per hectare um, of the two. And I found that the, uh, after deducting for paid out costs, uh, and I found that the net returns for women's, all women's group farms um, was again, uh, per farm was five times higher and per hectare was 1.6 times that of individual family farms. So uh, it was clear that uh, the group farming uh, in this context was, has been um, uh, quite positive in terms of productivity. And of course, the women talk about social gains, they're more respected, they learn, uh, they learn new skills, uh, they become more confident, uh, and many of them are even standing for elections and, and, and winning. Um, the, the government does provide them with training with a startup grant, and they use the uh, NABAD, which is a national bank for, um, you know, where you give, take credit, uh, to groups, uh, subsidized credit is given by NABAR to groups. Um, so, uh, but then you asked about replicability. And in fact, um, you know, alongside, I also looked at uh, the group farms in uh, then Andhra, then later Telangana, um, and, and also in, there are group farming in Gujarat and in Eastern India. Uh, they are under of the same scale, um, but uh, they are on smaller scale. Um, and what is interesting that's happening in Eastern India uh, is uh, that this is Bihar, North Bengal, and also you know parts of Nepal, um, is um, that you have uh, uh, all men's groups and you have all women's groups, and then some of the groups are mixed gender groups. And uh, again, you find that the productivity has been higher. It wasn't, the data collection wasn't as uh, of the kind and detail that I had done for Kerala and, and Telangana, but um, it was still um, 
uh, we'd asked, you know, before the group started, what was the uh, what was the output and so on, quite carefully, and then what it what it is now, and you find that um, it's much higher yields, uh, and also um, there, there was other interventions like irrigation, which also helped, uh, and um, during COVID. The uh, the both in Kerala and in the in Gujarat and in Eastern India, the group farms uh, found that they did much better. In Kerala, eighty seven percent of the something like thirty thousand farms which were cultivating in March of twenty twenty uh, survived. Now, whereas many of the individual farmers didn't because they couldn't get labor uh, or they couldn't sell their produce, especially perishables like vegetables. Um, uh, and again, in Gujarat, uh, interviewing the women, there's a um, NGO uh, cohesion uh, who's been doing this work. Uh, partly, um, it got revived. I did a workshop with them and it got revived. Uh, and they um, uh, they also found that the women said they were more food secure. And the same also in Eastern India. So um, uh, the uh, I think uh, replicability is always a complex issue because um, to be replicable, you need to have certain principles and you have to adapt them to context. Because the, the context can be different. Like if you take uh, Bihar, it's quite feudal. You know, many of the male farmers have to take land on lease and it's and so on um, so the so what I've done in my research is actually uh, draw out some of these principles that the far that you know it should be small size it should be voluntary it should be participative decision making um, you, it, it there should be uh, mechanisms by which you don't have free riding um, which is that people don't you might find that people don't turn up for work so you have to have some mechanisms of penalties and so on um, and and so you have to have some some principles uh, and um, you know, given those principles uh, i think if you apply that then it's uh, there's a great potential uh, i believe um, i do want to add that you know we we must rem we might remember that 86% of indian farmers cultivate less than 2 hectares or 2 hectares or less now, those are very small farms and they're not uh, uh, economically viable either in many cases um, so group farming can bring economies of scale it can bring new skills um, uh, because more than what one person will have uh, knowledge uh, systems um, uh, you have more resources um, if uh, and then you have more bargaining power in uh, you know in markets and, uh, and and in the community and especially for women, you have much more bargaining power. So these advantages can can be realized, I feel. And it's a model that we have not um, adequately tried. So I'll tell you one of the obstacles has been that during the 1960s and 70s, uh, India had land reform and they also tried in some states um, group farming. They called it cooperative farming. So sometimes people tell me, well, you know, we tried it in the in the 60s and it failed. So I said, you have to ask, why did it fail? Uh, and one of the, you know, among other reasons was that you tried to bring in small farmers and large farmers together. And there's a conflict of interest as a possibility. You know, the uh, and we know today collect, by on collective action that um, you have to have a degree of homogeneity. Uh, the other thing that's happened today is self-help groups. You know, we have a huge, uh, large numbers of self-help groups in India, several million. And that model is, uh, is like this. You know, you have, um, they, they're not all, uh, all women's groups, but most of them are. And they are small, they have worked together prior to the, um, uh, the you know, they, they, it's a savings credit, they, they, they rotate this, uh, the uh, credit uh, and so on. And that has been quite successful. So you can adapt that and build on that. And, and that is why, so uh, I've been arguing that uh, if whenever you see and you see an experiment or an initiative have failed, you have to ask, why is it? What did we do wrong? And can we change that? And I believe we can. We know the lessons today. That was a long time ago. And this is what I do in some of my papers as well. Uh, I actually directly address this and say, why did we fail then? And why can we succeed today? Right. So our final question to you, ma'am. Uh, in your work, you combine large data analysis with qualitative insights. 
how does the use of statistics and numbers enhance the quality of research in the social sciences? Well, uh, thank you um, for that question. I, uh, I, do, I do use large data sets where they're available, but I also you know, over the years have collected my own data when the questions I'm asking cannot be answered on the basis of existing data. So just to give you two examples, um, I, when uh, um, uh, Ritparna had uh, talked about um, this book of mine, Gender and Green Governance, I had looked at community forestry in India and Nepal. And I had uh, asked the question, we all talk about women's absence from governance, but what if women were present in governance? What difference would it make? And then there was all this conversation about there's a critical mass, we need 33% women to succeed. I said, has anybody measured it? Uh, where is this magic? Is this a magic figure? Is there something else? So I uh, then collected data, uh, both in India and Nepal, uh, on uh, community forestry groups. You know, these are, um, uh, India had launched this in 1990, had launched community forestry, where villages were allowed to protect village, uh, uh, their forest land, uh, and um, make their own rules for withdrawing uh, produce and for protection. Uh, and uh, I discovered that, you know, very few had women, but there were cases where they had many women or very few women or no women. And so it provided me a base. And, and to answer that question, there was no data. I mean, there's no data set because the question hadn't been asked. And so I collected my own. So I, uh, and similarly, I did it for group farming because of course, uh, people were not collecting data on groups and functioning of group institutions. So I am emphasizing this that, um, you know, um, it's important to ask the right questions and not be limited only by data and to go out and collect your own. But yes, if you have the data and you can be these days, you can have the quite interesting creative data sets um, that economists and others are using, especially economists, you know, they, they're bringing in data from law and uh, and then uh, linking it with economic data and so on. Um, but um, you know, so the, the, why is it important? Well, uh, there are many reasons. Um, yeah, it, to give you an understanding of the scale of the problem, to assess what factors underline, underlie it. So for instance, if I were to say, well, India has huge uh, gender inequality in ownership of land. Now, it would be less effective then uh, uh, my measuring it, uh, measuring the extent and telling you that only 14% of landowners uh, across uh, in rural land owning households across nine states are women. And they own only 11% of the land. Those are the statistics I gave you with the, an earlier question. Now surely that would be much more effective and dramatic than if I simply said, well, uh, you know, there's gender gaps in, uh, in, in inequality. So that's at the very, very basic level. We need statistics to uh, justify and to say, <clears throat> to give emphasis to whatever it is that we are saying. Um, but of course, more than that, you need statistical analysis to, um, uh, of various kinds uh, in order to see whether the differences are statistically significant or not, um, to control for other factors. Uh, so if you look at issues like farm productivity, um, in order for, to measure differences in farm productivity between, say, um, women uh, landowners or women managers of land versus men, um, we need uh, to uh, not only have data on relative productivity, but also to control for other factors. So if I were to say, well, uh, there are no differences, and you'll say, well, maybe the differences in fertilizer use, or are they irrigated or not, or the size of the land can matter. So you 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 have to you have to statistically control for other factors in order to uh, in order to convince you that it is the gender variable which matters and not something else. I mean that's very basic, isn't it? Um, so uh, so I think uh, the um, I do believe that uh, facility in uh, in uh, handling data in statistics is very important as a level of training. And I think we you know, should um, have it uh, at, uh, at all levels of high school. You know, the early streaming that we do 
of uh, arts and sciences and say, okay, um, in the arts or in humanities, you don't need it. I think it's very important across. Um, and, um, but at the same time, I do believe that figures only tell you part of the story. You do need a qualitative understanding to probe why it is that certain things happen or not. Uh, and I've already given you know, several, several, several examples, but uh, you know there, there are so so take and take one example. If I have a statistic saying okay, uh, women farmers use x x number of hours per hectare of tractors, and men use y. Uh, but that's not the full story. The full story is that do women get the tractors on time? Are they? And and if you ask them in the field, they'll say well the tractor owner first gives priority to the male farmers and then he'll uh, plow our fields. Now timeliness is very important for productivity and that is not captured just by one figure, right? So, so you need, uh, you need um, uh, qualitative uh, understanding and interviews in the field as well. Uh, I'll give you another example. And I'll end with that. There's a, you know, there's a lot of time you study. There's a lot of discussion among uh, sociologists, economists about the care economy and how much work women do and the domestic work load, which uh, is higher for women than men and which leads them to have um, dis be disadvantaged in the labor market. Um, so time you studies uh, are done and they're done now. They are in India and many, many countries. But suppose uh, you say, well, women spend nine hours on housework and men spend two. But there's that nine hours don't really tell you the drudgery. So if it's a rural woman, she might be fetching water and firewood and fodder. So the drudgery aspect is not captured just by time. But if you know that this is what rural women's time is used for and the multitasking and so on, then you will, uh, you will, have your analysis which is more granular and your explanations will be more insightful and granular. So, um, so I'm saying yes, uh, data is very important. Uh, carefully collected data, very important. Statistical analysis and statistical methodologies have now become very sophisticated. Um, uh, those are important, but also mixed methods um, with uh, um, an attempt to go to the field. Don't just sit in your on your computer and analyze. Uh, you have to. You should go to the field, and you might be surprised at the insights you get. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Agarwal, for taking time out and talking to us today. It's been absolutely incredible listening to you. Questions on gender, land, ownership are so crucial in the Indian context. And of course, your work in the area has been phenomenal as well as extremely important. And I'm sure our viewers are going to take a lot from this conversation. Thank you once again, ma'am. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me. I do have a website. Uh, which uh, you could uh, link them to. And uh, if there are some burning questions, uh, do write to me. Definitely, we'll do that. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you.